symptoms of a water main break tend to be it starts appearing somewhere on a street and then we go out and we get a phone call and we go look at it and the cause of it underneath the ground can be any number of, of things and that's one of the elements that we have to consider when we're looking at it and so initially you'll get somebody whether it's a member of our e-crew or a supervisor who happens to be on call um, go out and take a look and evaluate kind of what the situation is. We have any number of uh, kinds of main breaks from um, vertical and horizontal breaks and spiral breaks and joint leaks and if you have different kind of pipe like galvanized steel, you get pinhole leaks. Uh, a vertical break is your more run-of-the-mill break. It tends to make a reasonably clean line on um, typically cast iron pipe and uh, horizontal breaks run laterally across the pipe and they tend to shoot out a lot more water and um, sometimes instead of breaking cleanly laterally across the pipe it'll spiral all the way around and um, those ones tend to show a lot more water than your standard vertical break and so recently you probably saw on the news the big 24 inch main break that happened at 4th and Burnside was a big chunk of uh, the main that broke horizontally and in addition to to that being 24 inches generates a lot of water. They call all of the mechanics in the order of seniority and then the utility workers, the AEOs, which is an automotive equipment operator, that's the dump truck, and the backhoe. So they need one of each, or they figure out exactly what they need, and then that's what they that's who they contact on the call out. I take calls from the people out in the field and uh, try to get the appropriate people uh, there to, to manage the, the problem. When a pipe breaks, it stirs up all the sediment and can make water look like chocolate milk when it's coming out of the faucet. So then the phones go crazy, the queue is packed, then we just take call after call after call. But say it happened during the day, mm -hmm. we would get the call and then we either send one of our responders if he's available at the time or we send um, the district supervisor at the time to go take a look and see what they need. We would enter uh, a locate request generally. That's to notify other utilities in the area um, that we're going to be digging in this area and that they need to come and have their utilities located, which marked in paint so that we dig safely and we don't hit anything. Um, you come in and you locate electricity and natural gas and cable and sewer and water and anything else that might be under the ground in the area. And that's for the purpose of the fact that we have to excavate. When we excavate, um, we want to be safe because you hit a gas line um, that has obvious dangers. You hit an electri electrical line that has obvious dangers. We hit sewer lines. That's a problem for obvious reasons as well. And so. Um, it's both a responsibility to know where that stuff is so we aren't damaging our partner utilities uh, infrastructure, but also a safety issue that makes sure that our, our crews and our operators as well as the public are safe from the potential dangers that are below the surface. So we call in a um, utility locate. At the same time, we're calling in crews. It's, it's kind of crazy, but it takes care of itself. There's a certain steps you do, like Ty mentioned, was the, you know getting the locates on the ground, and you know going through those processes, and, and it happens almost seamlessly. You know, it's it's just like getting up and getting ready to go to work. 
you know, you get up, take a shower, brush your hair, brush your, you know, brush your teeth, and out the door you go. So then they come in on their way, and under the contract they have an hour to get into the yard here, and then they mobilize the equipment, and they get the materials that they think they are going to need, and they head out to wherever the job site is, which can be, you know, close to our facility here, or it can be stretched out to the, you know, the ends of the system, which are typically aligned with Portland borders. They confirm that their locates are down. The mechanic um, and sometimes utility workers will work together to kind of decide where the, where they believe the the leak is coming from, and that in and of itself is an art. So then they get in there, they excavate, they get down to the main. Um, we have a typical minimum cover on all mains of three feet, so the excavation is gonna be four feet, so you can get underneath of it. Sometimes during our excavation, we do damage other utility stuff, and we, we contact them and let them know that as quickly as we can to have someone either ID whatever we hit to make sure it's live or dead or to to make the repair. If you look at it, you see, it seems like there's a lot of people standing around. Um, but some of those people are dump truck drivers that get out to help. Um, we had three dump trucks, you know, because there's a lot of material to remove. Um, the excavation of that job was was pretty um, intense because it had multiple layers of concrete with other people's facilities embedded in the concrete. You look at the fleet of, of equipment that we have up in the yard. Um, it's clean. It's well maintained. Um, they they don't like to tear stuff up. Um, Shane Mallory was the operator we had on on Fourth and Burnside. Uh, very diligent. Very dutiful. Um, very conscientious about tearing out of the utilities. He worked for probably a good 35 minutes to get a piece of concrete under out from underneath a conduit that had the street lighting in it to keep from breaking it. As far as hand signals when they're digging. Most of the time, when it's like Fourth and Burnside, there was just a lot of excavation work. Uh, towards the end, you'll see a lot more hand signals going on, and that was basically to square up the corners of the ditch to make sure the shoring fits. Okay. Um, and and that's you know that's where it starts getting technical. So shoring is a protective system that you install. Um, the state law says it's uh, you must install once you're deeper than five feet, or when the conditions of the soil is required. So if you excavate a trench and you're four feet deep and you're in sand and it keeps sloughing in, you're required by, by law to put shoring in it because the, the trench itself will not support itself. So it, in order to protect the workers that are entering it, you are, you're required to shore it. If it's your standard um, vertical break, we have a repair clamp that goes right over the top of the um, break and it is, it's called a full circle repair clamp and it fits all over the top and it has three bolts in it and they tighten it and it squeezes on the top and um, you know, the history of that I think is pretty good in terms of lasting um, and it does the job and so it's really remarkably simple what the ultimate repair becomes for your kind of routine 
uh, main brake in that circumstance and you do all this work to locate it and excavate it and some of that is very challenging and then when you get down to the repair for our more routine main brakes it's very straightforward um, it starts getting more complicated you get a horizontal brake you got to cut out lengths of pipe when you cut out lengths of pipe then you got to do a shutdown and it, it just becomes more of a challenging undertaking when you're dealing with steel um, particularly on the larger diameter steel pipe they use boiler plugs and that is a challenge Then we uh, backfill with rock and um, prepare the excavation that we made for paving crews who are not the Water Bureau. They're from the Department of Transportation to come through and do the restoration and um, then we move on to the next.